Talk Season 6 of the Telly Award winning podcast coming to you live from WonderCon 2024 in Anaheim, California. I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, Ringo Award winning creator of fine comics like Avril Van Dyke's and the Jump. Uh, the other voice in the dark, if you're just listening. The man sitting to my left here on the con floor uh, is David Avalone. Very tired on a Sunday morning with my. Uh, thank you, thank you, Andy, for that uh, first part. <laughs> That's all I got. Uh, if you missed uh, any of our previous episodes, uh, episodes featuring comic luminaries like uh, David F. Walker, Stan Sakai, uh, Matt Fraction, uh, Kevin Eastman, uh, other really cool folks, uh, uh, you can find all those on Apple Pods, on YouTube, wherever you get your ear cracked. Come on back and check that all out. Great show for you today. Uh, at WonderCon, how's everybody doing? It's early, right? Yeah, good effort. Yeah, good effort. Good effort. Uh, but we got a great panel for you today. Great show for you uh, if you are listening at home. Uh, Evelyn, why don't you uh, uh, get this kicked off? Sure, sure. Uh, so we are joined today. We, we, we've lost a couple of panels. We lost one panel to COVID and one left the bass at home. Uh, so, uh, so we're a slightly smaller group than expected, but uh, we're joined by these two gentlemen. Hi, <coughs> excuse me. Wow, early. <coughs> I'm uh, Tim Sheridan. I write uh, TV, movies, comics, things like that. Rob Gunner. Uh, Rob Gunner also writes TV, movies, comics, things like that. Hey, it's almost like your experiences are relevant to our subject. <laughs> They're relevant to our subject. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I myself was working in film for 25, 30 years before I got the opportunity to write a comic. I transitioned from working in, I still work in film, but uh, I, I started writing comics in 2014. Uh, this is my 10 year anniversary writing comics. And an irony for me, which we might get to later, is that I kind of couldn't get arrested in film and TV, unlike these guys, uh, until I started writing comic books. And then somehow that made me uh, easier to hire to write a television show. I don't know, you figure it out. Uh, but we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> and I want to talk about, like, I'm going to ask our panelists, what did you do first, and how did you start to integrate to Rob Lyon and Uh I started out as a um, late night writer. Um, and as you know, when someone says started out, they mean started out seven years after <laughs> starting to try to do something. But, um, yeah, by the way, uh, when this is a rare experience where when someone in a panel at WonderCon says, I wrote Conan, does not actually mean far. Different Conan. <laughs> right. there, there was a lot of dry me out and lamentations of women, but that was a different story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah so I wrote, for, I, I wrote for late night shows, starting with The Daily Show with John, sorry, actually starting with Dennis Miller Live, Daily Show with John Stewart, and then eventually Conan, the, the gentle tall guy, um, uh, O'Brien. And I was doing that for about 20 years, and in the meantime, I uh, uh, was approached by a startup company, which no longer, which was is now an end-up company, I guess you could say, a stop-up company. Um, and uh, they uh, they commissioned the original comic for me, which was my first foray into it. And since then, I've written some uh, graphic novels, and I've also been uh, pursuing uh, freelance uh, animation writing for a couple of shows like um, uh, Teen Titans Go and uh, and Rebirth, Summer Madness, and stuff like that. But I think probably like uh, three of us, I kind of go in between the realms. Um, Pretty much at random, <laughs> depending on, on the market and jobs. Yeah. Well, 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 yeah, I mean, before we get into Tim, I mean, I think that, that is a really good point, is that, um, so when I got spit into business, it was like you were a screenwriter, or you were a comic book writer, right. or, or whatever, you chose one and you did it. And um, I was in the American Film Institute Conservatory with a lot of great writers, a lot of, a lot of great screenwriters, and uh, when we got spit into the business, you know, you could be a screenwriter, and, and you wrote a script, and if it was good, you you sold it, and you made a living that way. And then all hell broke loose, and you had to sort of scramble, and you had to sort of try to pick up the pieces when everything blew up. And there were a lot of people that were just like, well, I'm a screenwriter, why would I write a book, or why would I write a comic book, or why would I go into animation, or why would I? Um, and there was this time where you had to shift. You had to become a writer 
of things and not a screenwriter or and and or you had to become a, a content producer or whatever it was. You had to create things. Um, and if you if you did that, you survived and you're still around and you're on panels like this. And if you didn't, at least the people I know that didn't are in Pennsylvania selling insurance or whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think they would rather people in Pennsylvania need insurance. Yeah, I think they'd rather be writing comic books and some of them are some of them are good. They yeah. really need insurance. Yeah. So I, I, I think that that's interesting. We all have to diversify our bonds, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing about that. Yeah. <clears throat> Tim, what was your path? I mean, my my path is kind of strange. It might piss people off actually, but I I went to um, <clears throat> drama school because I, I was under this. So pretty. Because I'm so pretty. I was under this. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, I was under the mistaken impression that I was an actor, which people kept telling me when I was younger that, oh yeah, that's what you do, and you know, and I kind of bought it. Although I was writing all the time, I used to get, like, do that trick where I told myself I couldn't be a writer because other people do that, other people do it better, you know. Um, and so I toiled in obscurity, and I couldn't make a career in anything, in theater or on screen or anything like that. Um, and, uh, but I finally found my way into uh, television. The first uh, TV writing job I had was in animation on a show called, uh, well, I got two gigs at the same time with the same showrunner, uh, a show called Legend Quest on Netflix, which is a great little uh, supernatural family show. And then also a show called Justice League Action. Um, and Jim Crane was running both of those shows, and he, um, he hired me. And that opened up the door, the window into the world of IP for me. And so mostly what I have done is work with IP. Um, so it's odd to me when I when I get called, because when I'm transitioned to comics, I'll play it out that in a second, um, they refer to you as a creator. And I always feel a little bit like it's stolen valor because I, I just don't know that there's a whole, I mean, yes, there's a form of creation that Doing, it's, but it's still creative. You're standing on the shoulders of giants and stories and mythologies that have been. That I, would, I would argue that even when you're not doing the IP, you're still standing on the shoulders. I hate to be un uninitiated intellectual property. It's, uh, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if there is this thing called Cobra Kai, and then you get hired to write the Cobra Kai comic book or the Cobra Kai novelization. I, or, I pitched on the Cobra Kai animated series that I don't think is happening. Oh, uh, that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so comics happened for me because I've had it, I, I've done some work in uh, with uh, with DC and Warner Brothers. I worked on a few shows. I also worked on Teen Titans Go, um, Superhero Girls. I did some movies. I did Brave the Superman, The Long Halloween, Man of Tomorrow, and Dan DiDio, who was um, publishing DC Comics, wanted to bring in a bunch of TV writers to work on a new initiative at DC called 5G. Um, which was actually a lot cooler than people know. Like it was actually kind of good. Um, and that was what opened the door for me. And that initiative didn't happen, but another thing happened for me. And then I just kind of started doing that. And at the same time, I started doing stuff with Dark Horse as well. So, um, so it wasn't out of necessity that I diversified necessarily. It was sort of, I came in at a time when it was sort of a natural thing to move around between them. Certainly when it came to IP, yeah. intellectual property, because I was familiar with DC Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I think uh, the first comics job I got, uh, I was uh, I had written a screenplay. I wrote a screenplay that was financed and ready to shoot in November of 2008. It was going to be financed with the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Google it. Narrator. Google what happened in October of 2008. I, uh, I, I, I had a film die because the investors got made off. Oh, wow. That was another one that was great. Yeah. yeah, mine didn't get made off. They just literally were like, oh, those stocks I was going to sell to uh, make your movie uh, are apparently worthless now. So that's all I know. But it was a really good script by these and so on. So and a colleague read it and said, wow, you're a really great writer. I can't help you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I know a comic book editor that might be willing to hire you to write something. And it was for uh, Dynamite, which is the, the fifth or sixth biggest company. And at the time, they had a lot of 1930s pulp adventure IP. And uh, my father was a pulp fiction writer, and 
I think a little unique for someone my age. I was raised with Doc Savage and The Shadow and all of that, so I think they felt, like, you know, I actually said to them, you don't want someone to write Doc Savage who doesn't have to read the Wikipedia page to do it. I'm actually the guy, I've read the books, I know the characters, and he was like, yeah, that is odd. As an aside, the only time I've ever been a guest of honor at a convention, I was in 2017 a guest of honor at the Doc Savage convention. Uh, my wife is three years younger than me. I was probably 47 at the time. She was the youngest person in the room for <laughs> five decades. Like, aside from me, I was like 75. Uh, and that's great. It, it was actually a really great, fun time. But uh, all that said, I do think that it was interesting that you bring that up. I think my familiarity with the IP they were currently doing was helpful. And I will say, uh, one of the great things about working in IP as a professional is it validates your entire life as a nerd. <laughs> because someone says to you, someone out, a couple of years ago, I wrote, uh, someone asked me, do you want to write Gullivar on Mars? And I said, I actually know who that is. <laughs> I've actually read that terrible, terrible book. And yeah, I do want, I do want to write. Gullivar on Mars was a thing that came out a little bit John Carter of Mars, and some people think John Carter's ripped off of it. It really isn't. Uh, and it's not a good book, but it's got some intriguing premises in it that you can jump off of. But all that to say, like, I was like, oh, good, it was worthwhile reading that terrible pulp novel from 1895. I mean, it is funny, but I was, I was a DC kid. I grew up, <clears throat> only read DC comics exclusively in my life. I collect action figures and only collect DC action figures. And then I got a job with you. Part of it was because I just knew inside and out. Yeah. And yeah. You don't have to call Mark Wade, you know, some Superman. Uh, Although I still do. I mean, yeah, sure, sure, sure. And uh, Rylan, why don't you tell us your path to comics? Yeah, my path. I think the, the, this IP connection is really interesting. It, it, it's maybe not, not, not what I would have sort of attached to right now, but there's this rhythm here, and, uh, and not something I talk about too much. So, um, so yeah, let's go back to 2008. Um, <laughs> Let me take you back to the year 2008. Um, do it in a Heston voice. I'm going to speak the rest of the panel in that in the Heston voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, again, I went to the American Film Institute Conservatory, and uh, we all got spit out in the, the job market. And um, you you had an idea, you wrote a script, it was good, you sold it, and you kept going like that. I had a good couple of years doing that, uh, and then this uh, financial crisis that Evelyn was talking about happened right around 2008. And, um, that coincided with the, the last writer strike. Um, Great time. And uh, <laughs> everything blew up. Um, Hollywood used the whole fiasco as a way to kind of, as an excuse to sort of completely remake the way they did business. Um, suddenly, like overnight, they were making about a third as many films. Um, a lot less opportunity. Um, and, um, what this coincided with, perhaps coincidentally, perhaps not so coincidentally, was the IP revolution, right? Uh, we went from, it was the end of this period of time where original ideas were really valued, um, and the beginning of this era where everything needed to be based on something, uh, a book, a comic book, uh, a video game. And, and I wanna add, I wanna say, and say, the thing, the IP didn't even need to be successful. Yeah. It just, Men in Black was a black and white comic book Nobody read. It just had a great title and one great image and an intriguing premise. And then you read those comic books and you're kind of stunned that a billion dollar franchise that came out of this rat. But you know, God bless it. That's so even just being able to point to the thing and saying, it's partially executive cowardice. Yeah. It is not this guy wrote this great script, I want to make it. It's uh, someone else thought this was good. You don't have to stand there alone and say, no, I read this spec script and I really liked it and the writer's good and all that. You get to say, well, a publisher thought this was valid. So yeah. can we all- I think the industry term is cover yeah. your ass. Yeah, cover yeah. your ass. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, success is, uh, yeah, success is, there are different kinds of successes also. I mean, I remember sitting, you know, with, uh, uh, with, with Tony Kranz, who was the producer of 24. I had this comic book ever who, uh, that was often described as uh, 24 for superheroes. Um, and so it's no coincidence that he was the guy that funded option as a TV series, but he's holding this thing, and it's, he's, he's, he's looking for it. He's like, this, this looks and feels like a TV show. 
I could see it. And so that helped him do that. So, yes, so that's, that's why we drew the pictures for you. Yeah, that's why we drew the pictures. But yeah, so um, so this IP revolution happens. And, uh, and as I sort of hinted at before, it's like um, it killed a lot of people. There were, I, I, I went to, you know, I mean, I, I grew up during the Sundance movement. I saw Pulp Fiction. I said, I want to do that. I went to AFI and I got my snooty filmmaker education. A AFI was where like David Lynch went and Darren Aronofsky. And, I was going to be David Lynch and Aaron Aronofsky. Um, and so, but by the time I got spent in the workforce, you know, uh, there was no room for, for the new, new, the next David Lynch's. Um, and so all of these very student David Lynch's that I went to uh, uh, AFI with, like, they were struggling. They had no idea what to do. What do you mean you don't want to fund my passion project, my quirky fit of this or whatever? Um, and so I watched a lot of really talented people, people that were much more talented than me, um, kind of fizzle out and have to do something else. Um, and I was close. I had a couple of lean years, um, but I somehow, you know, just sort of bit and clawed and stayed afloat. Um, and at some point it kind of hit me in the shower. I was like, well, I don't know if they want IP, like, why don't I just give them IP? You know, like, I, I have all these stories I, I want to tell. I'm sitting around waiting for permission from like the five, you know, 50 year old white guys in Hollywood uh, uh, to tell my story. And you know, well, I can, I can, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm stuck in this frame of mind. Where I can only tell my story as a, a film or as a, a TV show or whatever. Um, it was a weird and bad place to be, and I'm like, well, there are eight million other ways I can tell a story. I can tell it a different way. Uh, a, a book or a short story or a comic book is very different from a, uh, a film or a TV show. But why don't I just start telling stories? And, and, uh, and if they want IP, let me just give them IP. Um, and so, in, a, in an instant, I became a writer of things and not just a screenwriter. Um, and so, um, I had an invitation. Um, there was a website at that, uh, uh, that point called Popcorn Fiction, and it was a guy named uh, Derek Haas, who um, wrote a lot of great movies. He wrote Wanted, and he wrote 310 to Yuma. Um, he is best known now for creating all of the Chicago uh, uh, TV series, Chicago Fire. He's just printing money now with Dick Wolf, so uh, I, I, he doesn't talk to me anymore. Um, but we shared a man group, and I, he was shooting a movie in Ann Arbor, or I went to, uh, to college. I, I was back in the visiting him on set, and quartered me on set, and he's like, I got this website going by, you, you know, do, do a short story, do a short story. And for the longest time, I was like, why would I want to write a short story? And, um, and uh, you know, I'm a screenwriter. Uh, and, you know, then the stars aligned. And, um, and so I, I wrote this, this short story. It, it was uh, based on an idea that I, I would have written as a, a spec script or, a, or a, you know, uh, or, or pitched around town and not sold. Um, and I wrote it as a short story, and it was about popcorn fiction. And, like, overnight, uh, we had a bidding war on it. And we had uh, Justin Lin on one side uh, coming off of uh, Fast Six. Uh, might still be the largest summer opening in Universal history. Great time to be in business with him. And then we had uh, um, Brett Ratner and Robert Spear on the other side. And uh, we had uh, Tyler Perry came on the top rope with, with an offer, which was really cool. We got to hang out with him for a little bit. And had a lot of other people interested. And it was this like wave, you know? And, um, and so we sold the short story. They paid me to turn it into a movie, all these things. Uh, that was really cool. And then we were in business. And I was kind of like, well, this worked. And my agents are like, ah, this is a fluke. It's not a fluke, I promise you. I promise you this is where things are headed. Uh, I was a visionary, see? Um, and, uh, and they're like, no, 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 just write the next spec. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. And so uh, short and sweet, like, um, I did it with, um, I did that again with short stories probably six or seven times since then. Uh, I started writing comic books. Uh, my first comic book, uh, Aberrant, was, um, was optioned for TV two weeks before the second issue hit. Um, uh, hit comic shops. Um, I uh, I just you know just sold a, a, a TV series uh, that is is close to full go, and that was based on a short story I wrote. Um, uh, you know, sold short stories to to, to Ridley Scott, and like I said, Justin Lin, and um, uh, Anthony Diggs on something now. And, um, it has just been an interesting way to do business now. Um, I. I do write on some other people's IP, but my main business is I create IP. And if it becomes a, a film or, or a TV show, great. Uh, if it doesn't, I don't really care because I've written great books and great comic books. And, 
I get the, I get the question a lot because I've made transitions between uh, film and, and, uh, and comics. A lot of screenwriters, particularly during the strike, the most recent strike, were like, well, I've got this script and I can't do anything with it. Should I make a graphic novel? And I always say the same thing. Do you actually like comic books? Do you read them? Do you like graphic novels? If all it ever is is a graphic novel or a comic book, are you going to still love it? Uh, if, you're, if your son doesn't grow up to be a doctor, are you still going to love him? Does he have to make two, three hundred thousand dollars a year? So, uh, and if they say no, I say don't spend months of your life and possibly five to thirty thousand dollars making a brochure for a television show. Don't do it. You know, have her do something you love doing as a comic book, whether or not anyone ever filmed it. It's still a great comic book. Can you pick it up? It's, it's very obviously a comic book. It's, yeah. Uh, and so that's the, and the, the thing that I found in comics, that I think you guys have too, is uh, the, the financial stakes are so low for the companies that you, you have a greater degree of creative freedom. And in the present world with things like Kickstarter, you, have, you can have complete creative freedom. If you, can, if you develop any kind of following out in the world, uh, the bar is pretty low to create one 20-page comic book. Particularly if you can take on an artist who believes in you and has faith in you, uh, you can become partners in a thing and, uh, and, and make it for little to no money if everyone is putting sweat equity into it. And obviously you don't want to go to that well too many times, but uh, you know, artists will take a chance on you if they think your work is going to get seen and going to get out there. You know? yeah. and, and if you're writing pros, it doesn't cost you anything. Uh, you have to love doing that. I mean, see, I, I, I'm a crappy guy. Like, my, my dream actually is to live out in the woods, write two novels a year, and not have to deal with anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trending in that direction. You guys may never see me again after this. If things go how I want them to go. Um, you gotta love doing it. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, you're gonna spend a lot of time doing this stuff <laughs> if you decide to, to commit to it. But um, here's, so, the, here's the thing I, I spent a lot of years writing movies that didn't get made. Right? Um, I mean, I, I came out to make studio art films. They stopped making studio art films. Uh, I got pigeonholed in this weird way of doing big, bad action movies, which I also love. I mean, we can die hard any day of the week. I'm not, I'm not trying to not that studio. There are these two sides of me. Um, but when you write like $250 million movies, like very few of those get made. Um, so I wrote a lot of movies that didn't get made, and that was devastating to me. Uh, I wrote my first comic script. Uh, I handed it to an artist, and about four days later, uh, I had a complete page back in my hands, um, and it was it was such a goddamn revelation. I I I, I, I cried probably four times in my life. Uh, I cried when I got my first comic page. It's uh, it is a thing. It's a religious experience. You you created something that then came to life. Um, it is so very hard for that to happen when you're writing movies <laughs> or, 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 or or TV shows. I used to call it the cocktail party problem. A lot of screenwriters. Mm -hmm. that very successful, yeah. like have huge houses in Beverly Hills, quit and do something else and left town because at a cocktail party someone asked them, hey, uh, what do you do? Oh, I'm a screenwriter. Oh, have I seen anything you've made? And you go like, well, no. <laughs> a lot of filmmakers you've heard of have paid me a lot of money to write things that they then decided they did not want to shoot and uh, that bought this house, but there's not a single frame of exposed film out there that anything I ever wrote. And with a comic book, you write a comic book and 20 days later, oh hey, here, we did, yeah. here is the thing itself. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. In a month, and, and in three months, it's gonna be in a store where anyone can walk in and, and pick it off the shelf and buy it. Yeah, and, yeah, and the screenwriting thing becomes so complex because it's like sometimes there are, you know, I have a Michael Bay movie that, that like 20 people have written on, right? Yeah. And um, so I spent a good portion of my career polishing other people's <laughs> terms, <laughs> right? Yeah. And so I have made some really bad movies, slightly less tolerable. Yeah. Uh, I made some pretty good movies, a little bit better, um, but my name's not on it. And so, what do you do? It's like, well, uh, well, have you seen movie X? Yeah. You know, about forty-three minutes in, Kevin <laughs> Bacon walks in, and he says, you know, hey, guys, you know, uh, yeah, that was my name. <laughs> that's, that's me right there. <laughs> Kevin didn't say that before. Kevin walked in and said, like, you know, hey, anybody want a peanut? And it was kind of falling flat in the table read. I, I, I swooped in. Yeah, I dropped that. No, there, there, is a, there is a guy, and I'm not gonna, you can ask me after the panel, so I'm not saying it with a live microphone. I know a guy who is part 
who has a credit on an iconic movie from 1990. He appears at conventions, I think he's at this one, talking about that movie as the sole representative of, oh, I, uh, let me tell you about the making of famous movie you've all heard of. The, he contributed one line of dialogue to the movie, I know this for a fact. Yeah. And he goes to conventions all over the world as the representative of this piece of IP. It's a good line, I grant you, but it's his only line in the movie. He presents himself as the screenwriter of it. And P.S. It is a comic book adaptation. So, like, also, there's, there was less creation of characters and situations. But I do want to ask our panelists, uh, going between the two, was it hard to learn the new format? Uh, what was the adaptation from writing film to writing comic? Um, I, I found it, you know, it was interesting. It's such a gear shift for me. I think I've talked about this in the podcast with you guys a little bit, but like the way you think of time when you write a script, a comic script, as opposed to a, you know, a TV script. Well, I mean, first of all, I wrote for late nights. It was like, you wrote something and it kind of goes on the air exactly like that happened. Like you wrote it in real time except cut off by two minutes for commercials. But, um, and that's that's almost like the purest form, you know, TV and movies get extensively rewritten. So like I went from that into comics and um, I started having to rethink about time, like how much time passes in each panel, how much information you have to do, and also how you don't have too much so it starts to lag. Uh, the page turn we talked about as well. Like you want to have something compelling at the end of it. Uh, the if it's a real like a, a physical comic, the right hand the, they call it. I think the recto page, the right hand bottom thing before you turn the page. You got to have something that people see. To completely rethink about structure in that way in terms of moments, small moments, big moments. And for me, it's really cool when I get into it. But it's like my brain like have to shift to a completely different gear. That somewhat procrastination happens. Like I was writing. Uh, my first comic while I was also writing monologue jokes for Conan. And so like, I would get my monologue jokes done early and have some downtime and think, hey, I'll just go write the comic book now. But it's like, hey, what's on Facebook? Hey, there's a cool article because my brain just didn't want to move over. And then finally, I didn't, I didn't want to leave. I was like, oh, this is amazing. I love the way that this flows. This is so cool. I don't want to leave this, but it's, it was a really wrenching thing for me to kind of go in between those things. And did, did you do any, uh, like you mentioned page turns, which is the thing I'm obsessed with. Yeah. Uh, that every, the pacing of a comic book is that literally every two pages, you have to come up with a reason for me to turn the page. And it can be as simple as question ask, question answer. <clears throat> it can be, oh my god, what's that? And I just <laughs> change the turn the tab and it's, you know, it's a monster, change the page. So it can be micro and it can be macro, but you have to propel the reader through the comic. And I, I read comics from screenwriters who go, they don't know that. That pacing doesn't exist in this comic, which is funny because it's a it's it's a lot like what we do in television sure. with you know uh, five act or even six or seven act mm -hmm. structure where before if, if we're broadcast before every commercial break mm -hmm. you know where you're kind of giving a reason to come back we learned that and I told you I went to drama school we learned that in drama school which is the uh, you have to at the end of act one you have to give the audience a reason to come back after intermission. Yeah. And and by the way, they get up and leave. But I miss intermissions in movies so much because of the the intermission. I've seen 2001: Space Odyssey about three times with packed audiences. The gasp when that intermission card comes up, <laughs> when you just realize that Hal is going to murder the astronauts, and then you've got to stand in the lobby. Yeah, spoilers, 1969. Uh, and then you have to stand in the lobby with your friends for five minutes, waiting for, we're going to go back in there and he's going to kill Gary Lockwood. Yes, I know it's going to happen. Uh, and that tension of that, like I said, it gets an involuntary laugh and a gasp. Like, intermission. You know, it's the only time I've ever seen an intermission but part used as a jump scare. But I think it's really different from, I mean, it's the same as what Tim's saying, but also it's like, it's a micro version of that. Like, yeah, that, 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 like you said, it's the, the pacing is so different. When it's only a two pages, right? Your act. It's the yeah, sitcom, it's, the it's shortest the sitcom, it's probably like eight or ten pages yeah. at the smallest before you have to have yeah. This you have to have something, but I also I think it's, it can be lower stakes. That's yes. the thing too. Yeah. But like, that break in a, in a film or TV is like, you know, is the person going to achieve their goal of their entire story? This is like, uh oh, someone's behind the door, or like, what the hell is that? Or yeah, it, it, it's, it's a lot like a horror movie. Yeah, it's yeah, like, it's like, like a yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, oh, you're a creep down the hallway, and we creep down the hallway, you know, what's behind the door? I can say anything about writing comics, it's a lot like a horror movie. 
Yeah, yeah. 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 Tim is Tim is the final girl. Uh, the, uh, the thing you said about uh, time is really interesting because uh, Howard Jakey does some uh, some pretty good podcasts and, and lectures on, on comic books. And I was listening to him once. We were talking, and I said, uh, "It's literally the medium, the only medium, and you and this is some Einstein shit for you. Space equals time. The size of the panel is a unit of time." The amount of words in the panel are the amount of time you're going to spend looking at the panel. The amount of detail, visual detail in the panel, is going to make you look at it for two seconds, or it's going to make you look at it for 20 seconds. And mastering that is the most interesting part to me of writing comics. It's just going, no, I want them to slow down and take this all. And I wrote a comic that took place, took place in hell, uh, and every issue. Uh, pages two and three, the first opening spread, was a two-page panorama of a new vista of hell. And partially because telling hell is vast, and you want, I wanted the audience for the rest of the rest of the book are five panel pages. But for that moment, I want them to go, right, this is huge, you know. Hell is vast. Yeah. Happy, happy Easter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One takeaway today is hell. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you, you wanna, it's all about taking time and breaking it up in interesting ways. And I've noticed an interesting thing: a lot of the cartoonist style in the industry, if you don't know, cartoonist isn't what it sounds like. A cartoonist is simply someone who writes and draws. There are writers, there are artists, there are cartoonists, and cartoonists, guys like Jake and guys like Eastman, guys like. Uh, you know, Walt Simons and those are the people who will give you a page with 20 panels on it. That as a writer, you don't want to be handing an artist a page no. with 20 panels. Like, no, draw all of these things, mm -hmm. very small. Uh, but the, the, the people who are writing their own material are like, I can do that, and that's going to be really impressive, so I'm going to do that. And Eastman in particular, but like in the ninja fights in Turtles, loves breaking down time. Loves like, Here's a hand pulling a sword out of a scabbard. Here's the sword going through the game. Like, what I would do in one panel of a guy slinging a sword, sword of a guy, he wants eight panels of every part of that. And that's also breaking up time. In a movie, it's a thousand insert shots. It's a thousand cutaways. I did, uh, so this book I've been doing right now, uh, Alan Scott for DC, we did a six page prologue on ramp story in an anthology that came out before the first issue. And uh, this was part of a, an initiative that uh, Jeff Johns had done, uh, had started at DC called the New Golden Age. So Jeff, at that time, he was still kind of kicking around DC. He saw the pages when they came in uh, before they were published. And he looked at one of the sequences and he said to me, Tim, what the hell are you doing? There's like, there's, there's 18 panels on this <laughs> You can't do that to your artist. What are you thinking? And I said, I promise you, in the script, it's five panels. Yeah, right, the artist volunteered yeah. to do that. But the artist decided he wanted to expand on the time and the moment yeah. and really give you a lot of different things. Yeah, the average, the average comic book page is generally four to six panels. Really, it's five panels. And if you're writing something for an artist, you kind of want to give them that. And yeah, you have splash pages for one panel or two panels, things like that. But uh, yeah, the other thing that's really interesting to me is things that are simple in film are complicated in comics and vice versa. Mm -hmm. One of my early comics had a conversation that two people were having on an external stairway, like a three landing stairway. And the artist sent me the pencils with the perspective lines of every step in the staircase. And he said, I want you to think about this page every time you consider setting a scene on a staircase. <laughs> I was like, that is an absurd amount of work. And in a movie, you go, like, yeah, we'll find a staircase. We'll shoot on it. So that, that's not an, like, uh, I did have three artists on Twitter once having a, a conversation about how I had made all of them draw traffic jams. <laughs> and how horrible that was. And one of them, I was like, in the script, it says close up of two people in the car 
and you can see the cars in the back window. I was like, you chose to draw a giant panel with 300 cars on it, man. That was not, that is not on me. Uh, but it, it, but you, sometimes you just don't think about how complicated a certain thing is to draw. Okay. Uh, I was just saying, one of the great tools available to us in comics, though, that we don't always get to use on screen is uh, omniscient narrator voice and caption, uh, captions. And uh, when I first started writing comics, my editor didn't want any captions in the book. And I was like, okay. <laughs> because it's a really great way of covering a lot of information for a short amount of time. But if you do it in a movie, if you do it in a TV show, now you've got, it's basically maybe Detective Noir, you can yeah. get away with it. It isn't, it isn't, when I started writing comics coming from film, this is a, a technique thing, I wrote in a very cinematic style, which was very popular at the time, 10 years ago, where there were no captions, where it was just the sound effects are what you would hear, the dialogue are what you would hear, that's it, no. And uh, the same artist who told me about the staircase thing was like, let comics be comics, man. Okay. Write, write a caption, it's okay. I will say though that mostly when I've done captions, I've done, it has been a character narrating it. And the one time I, I tried to do an omniscient narrator, in a Zorro story, it's a Zorro horror story called Swords of Hell. And I wrote the narration in this sort of poetic, flowery, 19th century, early 19th century style. And it was, I really liked the voice that I created for the narration. It wasn't like an, it wasn't an impersonal, uh, you know, authorial voice. It was, it had a, a, a thing to it. And then in the fourth issue, Zorro confronts the Tongva Indian goddess of death. And when she, I started writing that character, I went, that's who's been narrating. It's, 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 it's Tarmalak who's been telling this story about Zoro the whole time, talking to coming out of it. But like, I didn't know that. I ripped you off in the Masters of the Universe. Oh, did you? Did that, that, that exact same thing. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. I wanted to add one thing also about the yeah, adaptation. One thing is also um, word count. So when you write uh, scripts, you know, sort of like, you know, the sky's the limit to write as long as the piece of dialogue needs to be. Um, and it, it, it's mainly like when I wrote for Conan, Conan has sort of a roundabout way to tell me a monologue joke. He likes to kind of bring people along once he's done the setup, bring them back in with the punchline and kind of remind them of information. With comics, uh, just the size of the speech bubbles, you have to keep it small to keep the pacing going. Um, I follow Peter David has a great book about writing comic books, which I follow like religiously about like if you get like word and panel counts, which I sort of follow in the same of my artists. But you gotta keep it small so you have to think about how to write really fifty. And then also the comic book page is kind of nonlinear in the way with the, any kind of scripted thing, you're leading the audience all along. This is what happens, this is what you see, this is what happens, this is what you hear, this is what you see. Comic books, your eyes can wander all over the page. And sometimes you kind of need to throw some things in there to kind of remind people to bring them back. Uh, you know, uh, remind them what they were doing because they might sort of go, sometimes I'll put the bubble above or below something just because of spacing. So you have to sort of think about how people might experience the story differently, especially in sort of ADHD readers like myself. Um, I just think it's just a different way of thinking about how words are expressed and also sort of what the reader experience. Yeah, and, and the, one of the, uh, I did a comic that I did adapt from a screenplay of mine once. And the screenplay, it was a very snappy, funny, six-page dialogue scene. And when I went to do it in the comic, I was like, this has to be like two and a half pages, and I'm gonna lose 60% of these great jokes. Because I just, in a comic that scene, that's just too long a scene. It wouldn't have been too long a scene in the TV pilot, because it was the introduction of some important characters, but I like, the uh, four pages of it was mostly back and forth banter, and I was like, once I had established the Things that are happening in scene and the character have gotten in some good jokes. I gotta, I gotta move on. <laughs> I gotta, you know, and when you, uh, I don't know how you guys do it, but when I outline a comic, when I'm writing, when I start from scratch writing a comic, uh, I think a lot of people do this. You say, okay, I've got 20 pages or 22 pages, great, page one, page two, page three, and you just go, the page is a unit in the same way a scene is a unit sometimes. You just go, okay, page one is this. This happens, page two, this happens, page three, and four is gonna be this and this. And you and again it also helps you because you know even number of pages are your pages for your punchlines and your surprises, and odd number of pages are good pages that you're setting that up. Do you much if you did that for TV or film? Right? I never never do that. Although I do think about I do get really concerned about how it like formatting it so that I don't 
have a lot of stuff hanging at the bottom of the page that or could be you know, to the next page. But I'm sorry, obsessed. But I don't do the thing that you're talking about oh, in TV, which is odd. Oh, there, there are fence posts in, 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 in TV and film where it's like, well, you know, by page five, you kind of want this to have happened. By page 10, you kind of want, you know, just, just, yeah, that's true. just, just like a general Four dramatic. Page, yeah. yeah, yeah, right around page 30, right? Yeah, our, but our but first in, but in the comic yeah. book, you're, you're, you're like, fight scene starts. Yeah. This will take three pages. Yeah. Yeah, but this well, I, I have to and inevitably you have to cut it to two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But you but, know, comics are real estate, and you literally go like, I have twenty pages. It's all I have a hundred panels to tell this story in. Is the thing that's happening important enough for a whole panel? And by the way, we are talking about American comic books. Uh, I have a comic that's uh, in talks to be adapted into a manga, and I had a great Zoom conversation with a translator, with a leading manga writer. He was very interested in American comics and how do you do things. And he said to me through the translator, if you had a scene where a guy is brushing his teeth, what would you, how would you do that? And I said, it would be one panel that would look very much like this. <laughs> and he said, in manga, six pages. <laughs> that guy's gonna brush his teeth for six pages. It's gonna be awesome. He's like, but it's good. like that's not better or worse. It's just like we have phone books to fill. Uh, yeah, blast. Yeah, we've got phone books full of pages to fill with things that are happening. So, the tooth, if the toothbrushing is important enough to put in the script, I got five seconds. Oh my god. Yeah, it's like, like something. Exactly. I do, think it, I do think it filters back in the script of, like I said this in the podcast too, like when I started writing comics, when I went back to when I wrote a pilot, I started thinking about each scene. At the end of it, instead of just like in sitcoms, it's kind of like the end of the scene is a joke, like, that's not what the turkey said, or whatever. <laughs> but instead, I started thinking about the finest fake sitcom line I've ever heard. Kevin Bacon comes in and says, What's up? What's up? It's a callback. It's usually just a callback to a joke that you find earlier in the scene. It's not even structural. It's just like, That's the thing we said before. Yeah. But I started thinking after comics, I think, what, is that? What, if, what about putting the page turn mentality from the scene? It's like, What about, like, there's something funny. Yes, it's got to be funny, but also, like, there's something like, Oh, I wonder what happens next. Like, there'll be a little bit of, like, intrigue in the end of each scene. And I think that makes a stronger script as well. I will say, I was a film editor for, for about 25, 30 years, and I, I think it definitely helped me write comic books, uh, because you think about transitions a lot. You want a cool transition. I'm writing a comic right now called Don't Buy Her Meets H.P. Lovecraft, and literally the page I'm on, uh, they have stolen the last copy of the Necronomicon from one of the villains, and I have page, page one, the last page of the last issue introduced Cthulhu, which is the ultimate page 20 page turn. Ha! Giant space <laughs> monster. Uh, and then page one of the next issue, I, like, I'm not going to resolve that cliffhanger just yet. I'm going to give you one page of setup. Why? So that you can turn to page two and there's Cthulhu again. Big. So, but the end of page one, the villain is saying, I wonder what happened to my book. So that you turn the page and there's Elvira holding the Necronomicon with Cthulhu standing over her. And I think so much of my, the way I think about transitions from page to page and panel to panel comes from, I would do that in a movie. You know what I mean? Where's my book? Here's the book. Here's what happened in the book. Here's what, so you're always trying to think of ways, to, and again, it's all about dragging the reader through the story and getting them excited to chase it. The book, what happened in the book? Oh, there's the book. <laughs> Uh, and it's in the hands of a giant space monster. Yeah, we are running low on time, but uh, where Rob, where can people find you and find your work? Believe it or not, robcutter.com, um, and uh, where I'm selling my new graphic novels. Don't, don't type the believe it or not part. It's not goblins and other tasteless tales. Uh, and uh, I have a bunch of different kinds of work there, and I'm also on, I guess it's now called X at Apocalypse Howl. Uh, Instagram and Rob Cutner also, believe it or not. No, believe it or not, don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is now going to be so unoriginal, but yeah, find me on uh, timshowman.com. Thanks a lot, Rob. Stealing that phone. Thanks. And you're at the con. Where are you downstairs? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> table. Come on, e man. something? Anybody know? It's, it's, it's artist alley. Right? I'm in artist alley. I'm in artist alley. I need to sign it. Don't say how. We'll be there right after this. Is it yeah. comics experience? Is that the comics sketch art? Comics sketch art. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. The, yeah. The table. Yeah. Right. I'll be after this panel. I'll be at uh, Small Paris 46. Uh, you can find me online at David Avaloni. Freelance.com. Oh, cool. Oh. They can set it up. Go, Daddy. Stinks. 
I, I searched for davidavalani.com like 20 years ago and forgot about it. And then when I went to build a website about 10 years ago, they're like, oh, GoDaddy owns that domain. Well, I had to buy it. Like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not buying. I'm cheaper. I, I had to design it. I'm not buying davidavalani.com if anything. Uh, and uh, I'm on, I'm, because of the unusual name, I'm easy to find out with all of the social medias. And uh, Elvira meets HP Lovecraft number three will be out in uh, mid April. And then at the end of April, I have a new comic coming called Drawing Blood, which I co created with Kevin Eastman. Uh, and that's coming from Image Comic. Uh, I am also at Rob Cooker. The <laughs> event. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, uh, he rents me the, uh, the back house. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. It was, so uh, you're actually I, at the main event. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, I own RylanGrand.com. I don't do anything with it. Uh, but I am at uh, RylanGrand on all forms of social, social media. That is R Y L E N D G R A N T. Um, I spell it because it's not a real name. My parents just kind of drunkenly arranged letters to settle me with it. So now I have to spell it for everybody. Um, but yeah, you'll see everything I'm up to uh, there. You can get you know copies of uh, Aberrant and Banjax uh, in fine comic shops uh, everywhere. Suicide Jockeys um, on Amazon, all that stuff. Uh, I also have a backer kit shop. If you go to uh, uh, Peacekeepers, is my, my latest deal. It's a far west crime drama. If you go to peacekeepers.backerkit.com, you'll find all sorts of great brown and great stuff there, signed stuff. And, um, yeah, good business. Uh, go see it, but um, thanks for coming out, guys, and uh, have a great time. And thank you for joining us. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or other fine purveyors of ear crack, please leave us a five-star review. And wherever you're watching and or listening, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We'll see you back here next week for more madcap hijinks on the Writer's Block.